I see that uh, Shira Moulton, who is an education reporter for us, has joined uh, the discussion. Shira, you're free to ask questions uh, later on in the discussion. If you care to, you don't have to, of course. Um, I want to say for everyone's benefit, Lori Alhadef certainly knows this, that um, that uh, reporters in the newsroom who cover these school board races don't have any role whatsoever in editorial endorsements. That is solely the purview of the editorial board headed by me with participation by my colleague, Dan Sweeney and others. So, uh, Lori, thank you for uh, filling out the questionnaire, participating and joining us this afternoon. Um, one of the things you said in the questionnaire was that um, the recent organizational chart changes that Superintendent Vicki Cartwright has made, you felt should have been workshopped before the board uh, ahead of time. Are there are there changes in that in that org chart that you uh, have problems with or don't don't approve of? Well, I well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. And with for the question, I really wanted this to be workshop before coming before us at a school board meeting to for a vote. It would have been, I think, uh, helpful for the entire school board to understand all of the, the massive changes that occurred uh, with the organizational chart. I think you know, going to having regional superintendents, um, from my understanding before Mr. Runcie, that was in place and that worked really well. And I think it just would have been more helpful for us to understand what their you know, job responsibilities are and how everything, every, how everybody reports to who and the interworkings of that. And I also think it would have made staff more with understanding and the community comfortable with all the decisions that she made. Do you generally think the regional superintendents are a step in the right direction? I do think so. I think that the regional superintendent person will really know what's going on, like say in my district four, and really know my schools and their needs. And when I have issues, I can go to that person and they should have an understanding already what I'm talking about, as opposed to Dr. Cartwright having the whole entire school district. Yeah, we had a candidate in another race yesterday uh, support the idea of regional superintendents and the, this candidate's view was uh, unavoidably uh, just through growth and through the population growth of Broward County, the system is too big. And it's so big, it's almost unmanageable in one big size. How do you feel about that? Um, I agree. I'm from New Jersey and our school districts in New Jersey basically is an elementary, middle and high school. That's the entire school district. So it is very challenging to implement anything with fidelity across the entire school district. It takes a lot of checks and balances to do that. And um, I mean, there are pros too, uh, as far as, you know, probably purchasing things um, where we would get a better, you know, deal on it for the district. But I, I generally think we are definitely too big um, and having smaller school districts, I think it would just be more manageable. Okay, uh, shifting gears a bit. Uh, there was a question on our questionnaire about the grand jury report and how soon and whether the grand jury report should be made public. And, and I wanna ask you about that, but I also wanna uh, call attention to your comment in that answer. You referred to a quote, culture of corruption in the Broward County Public Schools that goes back a long time. I do wanna ask you, what can you do? What can you do as one board member to rid this district of a culture of corruption? So I think it's something that I've proven already and that I did do by bringing a B item to fire Mr. Runcie. Um, unfortunately, at that time, my colleagues weren't receptive to the idea. And well, not all of my colleagues, some of them were. So it failed at that time. So I, I believe I've proven myself already to hold Mr. Runcie, the past superintendent, accountable for his mismanagement of our smart bond program. 
have things improved since Runcy left in terms of the management of the bond program? I think they have improved. I I, I do um, one of the things, and I did write in my um, write what I wrote up to you was that I you know the Dr. Cartwright needs to hire a chief of facilities. Um, that is something that she needs to put in the front of uh, her goals. Um, but ACOM is moving projects forward. I think we have like 163 projects uh, that they're working on currently right now. And it it is um, supposed to be our whole program finished by 2025. It is a goal of mine if I'm reelected to the school board to see that we make that deadline. Um, unfortunately, the longer that we go with our bond program, our you know, ultimately it's our students and our teachers that are affected. And, you know, the, the, our facilities, you know, having issues with our roofs leaking, it's a problem because then it affects everything inside the building and it gets wet, it gets moldy and it affects the environment that our students and teachers have to go to school in. Right. Okay. By the way, have you, uh, have you appeared at any forums in public at which your opponent, Kimberly Coward, was also present? No. Um, have, have you have you appeared at candidate forums yourself? Um, so I was, um, I interviewed for the Hispanic vote, but this is my first appearance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, you are the only, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. You're the only member, current member of the Broward County School Board who voted against imposing the mask mandate, you know, over the strong objections of the Department of Education and the governor's office. And uh, we, we know how that evolved. But I, I assuming that you feel that uh, that you voted the right way. Why was your vote the correct vote in that situation? So we weren't telling parents and students that they couldn't send their child to school without wearing a mask. Well, I wasn't in my vote. <laughs> and I um, wanted to give parents the option whether to mask or unmask their child. And I also, during that meeting, I asked our general counsel for guidance uh, in being in compliance with the law. And she did say that we would be in compliance with the law if we allowed parents the option whether to mask or unmask. So you felt you were following the advice of your general counsel, right? Um, yes, and the law. Do, do you find fault with the way the other board members voted? Um, I do. You know, I think it's very important as a school board member that we stay in compliance with the law, one, and in this situation, it was giving parents the, oper the, the option, according to the law, to whether the master child or unmask their child. And, um, you know, at the time, there was going to be financial consequences to the district. And, um, and then later, it turned out that those financial consequences, they went away, but it was going to be for schools that did really well they were going to take away their funding and that upset me because it's like why are we going to take you know our teachers that are excelling to take away their money i mean ultimately the government governor didn't do that but i was like you should take away the the salaries of the school board members okay so you 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 supported uh stripping the board members of their salaries over this absolutely we were the one that made the decision and the vote. Okay. Um, my colleagues may want to follow up on that. I'm going to pause. I don't, I don't want to monopolize the time. I'm going to open the floor to either Scott Travis or Dan Sweeney for questions. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I had a couple. Um, you mentioned that there were uh, there were regional supervisors before uh, Superintendent Brunsey. Do you know why uh, that was changed under uh, under his leadership? I do not know why. When I, I came in 2018 and it was, he was already superintendent. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, in your questionnaire about being um, positive about there being term limits for school board members, um, but also expressed the worry that this would lead to uh, con consolidation of power 
in uh, unelected staff and lobbyists. Um, I can tell you from experience covering the state legislature that that is in fact how it has played out in Tallahassee. Um, you know, there are uh, there are lobbyists there that have far more power than they used to uh, prior to, to term limits. So how do you ensure that power in the school board remains with elected officials and not with those who are hired to influence them? So it was passed this year to put the 12 years school board term limits uh, that went into law. Um, you know, and I, listen, I think that there is value with the historical perspective that a school board member brings to the table with being on the school board for, you know, X amount of years. However, um, from what I've seen on my own board, that school board members that have been there for, you know, over 12 years, um, they don't have the same drive as, you know, say uh, a newly, a newer elected official. Um, and they're not as organized or prepared to come to the meetings. And they're not bringing a new, it's new voice or value to the conversation. So you feel like after after 12 years or so, a lot of school board members, not not all I understand, but a lot of school board members tend to start kind of phoning it in, so to speak. They're yeah, ill-prepared. Not, not, not showing up to meetings, not being prepared, um, not, you know, I I try to, I go to every one of my schools every year. I, I try to go to as many events as possible. And I think that energy to be able to do that becomes less and less as the more time that you're actually on the school board. Um, since you brought it up on your questionnaire over uh, on the, the school safety issue, I wanted to ask you, Alyssa's law was passed here in Florida in 2020. I know it's still being kind of implemented, but what are you seeing as far as implementation of it in Broward? Are there, are there is it moving too slowly or, or what, do you, what do you think? So just today I was at Beacon doing a video for Alyssa's alerts. Uh, we're going to be putting out uh, the video before the start of the next school year to encourage our teachers and staff to download the app on their phone. I think that there has been some hesitation, unfortunately, that teachers think that the app is tracking them, which it's not. Once they leave the campus, their panic button doesn't work, only their tip line works. The, the Alyssa's alert was endorsed by the Broward Teachers Union and BPAA, the principal's union. Um, so this video is going to be um, put out right before the start of the school year. And also our last school board meeting, we put into policy and in one of the safety policies to have training, mandatory training on Alyssa's alert. So I think that there'll be a greater download rate once that the, all the teachers and staff that they do the training. And, and then I'm also trying to get staff to reach out to the phone companies like Verizon, AT&T to give teachers and staff a discount on their, their phone bill uh, if they have downloaded Alyssa's alert. Uh, I have a question actually related to that same issue. Um, do I think Palm Beach County, if I read correctly, may have done something where you actually each uh, employee got it wasn't a phone thing. It was like a little tab or some kind of uh, contraption. I can't. Uh, a badge. A badge. Yeah. So so that way, you know, for those people who say I don't want to, you know, I mean, I kept hearing all these concerns about people not wanting stuff on their phone for whatever reason, either privacy or just not having another app on, on there or saying I, you know, if you want, you know, you should provide me the phone if you want me to do this. So whatever the the issues were, do you think that that I, I know that may not have the same um, features as what you have on the app, but do you think in retrospect that might have been a, a better option? I think that we could have um, a combination of the two, uh, meaning that if uh, we and, and Safer Watch does have like a, a circle type of panic button that could clip onto someone's shirt. And uh, maybe it's the the guy in the golf cart outside by the fence or the, you know, at, like at MSD, they have a, a box that the security staff sits in before they come in. 
I think that there could be like key positions where they would have that type of panic button um, where if they're adamantly against downloading it on their phone, that they would have that type of button to be used. So I think there is an opportunity to do both. Um, you know, the, the app does have a lot of benefits as opposed to, you know, just the badge, but I, I'm hoping that our teachers and staff see that this is, you know, life-saving measure to get law enforcement on the scene as quickly as possible to take down the threat or triage any victims in a medical emergency, that they will see the benefit to doing it once they get the training and put it on their phone. Do you know what, um, how many have it uh, downloaded right now? Is there a percentage? Or? So it's, I, the last time I have checked, which was probably about six months ago, it was, we were at 5,000 downloads, but I'm sure good. the number is a little bit higher. Um, and you know, the, the app, the other thing that uh, actually Donna Korn pushed for at the last school board meeting was for staff to make it mandatory on every teacher's computer that the app would be in place at the start of next school year. And we were told that that it's going to happen unless something comes up, they're going to let the board know. Okay. okay, thanks for that. Lori, uh, you get around the community a, a lot, we know. And uh, so I want to ask you this question from what you're seeing and hearing the um, extension and the expansion of the property tax on the August 23rd ballot, the referendum for the property tax, is it going to pass? I hope it passes. I'm supportive of the referendum. You know, we definitely need to pay our teachers more money and more money towards safety, SRO officers, and mental health. Um, but you know we are in a difficult economic time right now gas prices are up food prices are up everything is up so um i think it's going to be a challenge as you may have seen you know we we editorialized in support of the of the tax we also said that the school district is not doing enough to get the word out aggressively enough with voters you know it's always a challenge in broward to get people to vote in an august primary and you, as you just said, this is a tax question. Uh, the school district has gotten a lot of adverse publicity for lots of different things in years. And so uh, I, I, got, I guess to hone in, hone in on my question, um, should the school, what else should the school district be doing to build public support for this thing? So I have, and Scott Travis will know, I have been asking and pushing at school board meetings to figure out what are uh, communication plan would be. And, and I've asked in emails and I, it's been, it's been challenging, um, as far as, uh, for us to be able to communicate and get more information out there. You know, personally, what I think we should be doing is more videos, um, uh, communicating about our referendum and how the money is, um, going to, Sorry, that's my dog, Roxy. <laughs> How that money is going to um, be used. And then also I think it's very important that we do a better job communicating how we use the money in the past referendum. Okay. All but right. again, I'm not staff. I that's you know what I'm saying? Like that they they have to do it and the superintendent needs to hold staff accountable for getting that done. Right. Um, were you one of the board members who voted to place the question on the August 23rd ballot? Yes. Tell me why um, you made that decision as opposed to putting it on the November ballot when it's perhaps accessible to a lot more voters. So, it was from my understanding by getting it on the uh, August ballot that that it would have a greater chance of passing. And why is that? I mean, less people vote 
but you know, there is a probably a greater, um, you know, push probably from people who are voting who are teachers or security staff or, you know, mental health people that are going to have jobs based on the passing of this referendum. Okay. I just want to make, I'm well, it, I'm sorry, and, also, and, and also maybe, you know, the, it's the school board members, uh, I mean, no, not all the races will end in August and some will go to November, but there'll be a lot of con my constituents coming out to vote in August. Okay. All right. Have you endorsed or will you endorse candidates in any of the other school board races? No, I um, haven't endorsed anybody. I, I don't plan on. I'm just focusing on my race. Right. I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to read something to you and ask you to comment on it. Uh, and what I've got in front of me here is the um, web page of Governor Ron DeSantis's education agenda. You know that he's getting very directly involved in endorsing candidates for school board races all over the state. Uh, our latest available information, at least uh, as of uh, yet late yesterday, was he has not taken sides in any race in either Broward or Palm Beach County. Uh, that, that may change. But he says on his website, and I quote, the DeSantis education agenda is a student first parent centered initiative focused on setting Florida's children up for success, ensuring parental rights in education and combating the woke agenda from infiltrating public schools. Um, generally speaking, and elaborate as, as you would like, but generally speaking, is this trend with the governor, with Ron DeSantis, do you see this as a good thing or a bad thing? So I support parents um, involved in their students' education. However, I don't support trying to change history. I think it's very, very important that we are teaching history as it was and that, that, we, um, that we're not picking and choosing from history what to teach our students in school. I think that um, it is a very slippery, scary road that he's going down because when we, we our hope is that when we teach history, that history won't repeat itself. Okay. Um are you seeing anything, you know, through osmosis, through political activity? Are you seeing any signs that Ron DeSantis is trying to inject himself and to reshape the composition of the Broward County School Board? No. I don't okay. see that at all. I mean, if I, I think if if he was going to he wouldn't have put Daniel uh, Fogan Holly in that position. Um, I think he would have, uh, if he was really trying to change the Broward School Board, he would have put Dr. Natalie Lynch Walsh in that position because Daniel lives in Coral Springs. So if Daniel was going to run for school board, he would have ran against me. Right. Understand. Okay. <clears throat> We had a question on the questionnaire about the so-called don't say gay bill, the bill that bans classroom discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity. You opposed that bill and you called it homophobic. Why is it homophobic? Because it's, they're scared to say gay and it's okay to say gay. And I think we need to embrace LGBTQ plus students uh, in our schools. We need to support them. LGBTQ students have the highest level of suicide and that they, they bring a, um, a strong, enriched, and, and they bring amazing things to our uh, Broward County Public Schools. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, you say also in the questionnaire, quote, homosexuality is not something we need to keep secret from children of any age. 
the people who support supported the so-called don't say gay bill have said i'm paraphrasing but i've heard this a thousand times they've said what are people upset about all we're doing is saying that from grades kindergarten through eight through grade three you know a, a second grade kid we're not going to talk to a second grade kid about sexual orientation um what, what do you say to that so i think it's it's okay at any age to talk about uh lgbtq and someone being gay and i think what what people why they're like saying oh kindergarten through third grade for some reason they think that their teachers are going to indoctrinate their child in school and that they're trying to turn them to be gay and that's just not happening that's not true and um i think it's it's a real shame that um that you know where we're at right now okay uh, Steve, can I ask a follow up to that? Um, yes. Question. Um, given that it is the law, um, there's some question about how it's going to be enforced. How do you see that changing as far as the Broward School District? Because I understand you haven't really gotten clear guidance from Tallahassee on what to do that. What will be different you know, be in Broward because of this law? So um, the Florida Department of Education, they're having a meeting um, relatively soon. Uh, and they are going to be discussing, I guess, putting whether it's rules or um, around it to guidance for the school boards to um, to how to roll this out. And then I know that we're also going to be ha workshopping it to discuss it further. Lori, is it a good thing that, uh, that the school board races are nonpartisan or should people run as Democrats and Republicans? No, I think it's a good thing that it's nonpartisan, uh, even though everybody always asks, are you Republican or Democrat? And people make it partisan. Um, but <clears throat> I, I definitely am fine. You know, I think it's fine that it's nonpartisan. Yeah, I, I think you're aware there was a bill in the last session of the legislature to make them partisan. It did not pass. Um, and I think it may be, it may be tried again. Um, what about the issue of um, the tremendous amount of academic backsliding that we've seen from students everywhere as a result of COVID and how to how to rectify that and catch those kids back up so we um have summer school and um we we had there was a lot of money that went into trying to bring our students up to grade level there is uh tutoring <clears throat> this ask bria tutoring that we we have and so one day I was on my, my, my boy's computer. And so both my boys go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And so I was like, oh, let me click on this Ask Bria. I wanted to see if it worked. <laughs> and so I pushed the button and then I was like waiting, waiting. And I was, I was waiting like three minutes. And then a teacher came on and I was like, hi. And I introduced myself, Lori Alda, if you're a school board member. And I was like, I was just trying to, you know, seeing how this worked. And um, so no, but it actually worked. I was happy to, to see it in action. And, um, you know, for a student who, you know, needed that tutoring. And I think it was, it's wonderful because it's, it gives all students that, opportunity to get the tutoring you know like for example um my boys you know they were struggling in some of their classes you know and i'm paying for private tutoring and it's awfully expensive but not everybody could afford to pay for the tutoring so ask bria gives all students that opportunity to have tutoring okay um everyone of course knows um your story and the the story of what um led your activism and education and um uh, but i think what is not as well known about Lori aladef is that you yourself have been a teacher you've got what uh, in new york and new jersey six or seven years of teaching experience how how has that shaped you how has that 
shaped your, your service on the school board? So I taught four years in New Jersey and one year in New York. And I, as a health and physical education teacher, as a coach, um, and then I also have my master's in education. And, you know, after I was a teacher and I had my daughter, Alyssa, and, and my other two boys, I was a stay-at-home mom for 14 years. But I feel that as a, having that experience in the classroom teaching, you know, I it definitely helps me on the school board when I'm making decisions on policies and procedures and uh, our schools. It, it definitely helps me, you know, with that background to make better decisions. Okay. All right. Um, and I, this is kind of a catch-all question. I mean, your opponent, Kimberly Coward, could not be with us this afternoon, but has, has anything reached you about her platform, her ideas, her goals that you feel you'd want to respond to? No, I know nothing about her. Okay. Do you even know if she lives in the district? From my understanding, she does not. Is that allowed? From my understanding, yes. Uh, if you get elected, then you're required to live in the district. Okay. Yes, she's a criminal and family law attorney, uh, practices law with her sister, maybe, uh, in the firm of Coward and Coward. Um, um, I mean, you would know this, Lori, but uh, but maybe not. I mean, has, it, it, does, the, does the name ring a bell as somebody who's ever been to a school board meeting? Uh, address the school board anything like that no okay do you know i know mr runcy sometimes and his supporters would put uh school board members up in past years uh on certain races do you know anyone who is behind um her challenge is a particular group or particular organization or is this just she just a citizen on her own said i want to run for school board in a district i, I may not live in yeah, I honestly don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, we appreciate your time this afternoon very much. We'll probably oh, be can back. Can I, I ask a question? I, yeah, I, by all means. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering, Lori, you probably saw my stories about the uh, Mr. Runcy and um, his involvement with Chiefs for Change and using um, the, and, and they use some of the information from Broward, the, Stoneman Douglas tragedy, the uh, the cyber uh, attack, uh, all those things, you know, for this other, you know, outside venture. I was wondering what your your thoughts about that are. It's extremely difficult and hard for me to to fathom that where the largest mass shooting in a school where seventeen people were killed. And the superintendent at the time was the superintendent now feels that I guess he's now an expert in safety and security. <laughs> what? And, no, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Lori. Finish the no. Talk. It's okay. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I was going to add I, what 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 you, what you just said prompted me to ask um, what more needs to be done to make schools safer in Broward County. Great question. Yeah. So we have a confidential document, uh, and there's things in that assessment that I want to see implemented across the entire school district. Uh, also, we need to make sure that we're doing the basics, locking doors. It upsets me when I see a cone in a door or a little wedge in a door. You know, we can implement as all different safety measures, but at the end of the day, if we have human failure or, you know, putting a wedge in a door and, you know, keeping a door propped open, it's going to make our schools less safe. So, Training is huge. So that's a, like continuously train on everything. We're supposed to be moving towards away from colors this year to situational awareness, plain speak language drills. 
And um, so that is something that's going to be a huge learning curve for our school district this year. We need to make sure that behavioral threat assessments are, are, are followed with fidelity and that whatever resources or wraparound services that we need to give to students that they're actually given to them. Uh, more mental health uh, for, you know, to be able to meet the students where they're at. And I think too, we need to start that in elementary school. Start, start with it when they're young to be able to get to the root of the cause and problem. Um, we discussed the grand jury report earlier in this interview. Uh, did you testify before the statewide grand jury? Yes. Um, the grand jury report has not been released and I know that there are some legal complications or there are legal safeguards built in, um, that, that regarding certain portions of the report that may be in dispute, but, um, how important is it that this grand jury report is made available to the general public before the election? So I, I think it's really important that the grand jury report is released before the uh, primary. Um, it's, I think it's important for voters to have as much information possible about, you know, candidates or Broward County Public Schools before they vote the next school board member into office. Well, Lori, what do you feel about all the criticism you hear from, and I'm sure you've heard it before, this was a Ron DeSantis political witch hunt to go after Mr. Runcie, to go, you know, to go after a Democratic uh, school board or school district and that. So um, there's yeah, a lot of people who feel in this county that uh, th this isn't a legitimate, uh, uh, you know, this hasn't been a legitimate investigation. What's your response to that? So um, my response is that, you know, my daughter Alyssa was shot eight times in her English classroom at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And as a mother, I want to see, to make sure that anyone who was responsible for what happened that day or led up to what happened for that day are held accountable. This is not, this doesn't directly bear on your candidacy for re-election to the school board, but uh, I think the public would be interested in knowing, we're interested in knowing, how closely are you following the jury selection process uh, for the, the Parkland killer? I'm not honestly following it much uh, for my own mental health. I need to really just stand and watch from afar. Um, it's it just, I can't, uh, I can't just, I can't be watching it every second. Understand. And, and just to return briefly to the subject of the grand jury report, is there, is there any discretionary role whatsoever by the Broward County School Board in deciding whether the report becomes public or not? Or is that completely out of the board's hands? No, the board has nothing to do with that. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, well, uh, we appreciate your time, your accessibility, your forthright, very straightforward answers to the questionnaire are much appreciated. Um, Lori, uh, thanks for being with us today. The best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Okay. See you Bye -bye. later. Bye.